بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Greetings to all, uh, especially our, our listening audience. Uh, but of course, to our fellow classmates, class members of the University Online Learning Course, uh, welcome uh, to today's class, today's session. Uh, like always, you know, I'm anticipating uh, some great things happening. You know, it's never a disappointment when uh, we engage the process of nunetics uh, and, and exploring truth, you know, looking at the Quran, looking at the natural environment, the fitr as, as, uh, as Quran gives us the most appropriate way to describe that, uh, and, and to pull from it the, the lessons, the, the signs, the ayat uh, that the source creator is pointing us to uh, in opening our minds and our hearts to learn all the, the valuable things that we need to direct our life. And of course, uh, we have things that we consider very fundamental and basic, uh, very concrete, uh, and those things are important. You know, the things that we do every day to, uh, to maintain and to uh, grow and develop the life. But equally as important, if not more important, is the abstract. Hence the subject matter for today's discourse. Uh, it's on the concrete and the abstract, a uh, Quranic perspective. So again, I am anxiously waiting for international instructor Benjamin Bilal uh, to get this uh, linguistic party started. And it looks like he's ready. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> the talking stick. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. I accept it graciously. As I begin with Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, <clears throat> excuse the scratchiness in my voice. Uh it's not sore, it's just uh, overworked. <laughs> but it's overworked to doing something that I love doing and I love teaching, whether it's on the telephone or you know, on a webinar or face to face, you know, I do all of it. And I love it. It's what I was built for, I believe. So thank you, William Safia, for handing me that walking stick. And I'm going to take you on a journey today uh, that's going to be a bit of a scenic route. What do I mean by that? I'm not going to do the traditional, you know, throw words up on the screen and, you know, and have you read along like romper room, you know. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to just talk to you. I'm going to talk to the audience. I've done that a few more people in here. And... um I may stop every now and then and ask you a question. That's how we want to do it today, just nice and light. I want to get you used to when we break down into these uh, smaller groups starting next week, starting this week, actually. Sunday is the first day of the week. We should say of the strong days ahead of us. We don't want to be weak anymore. That's been the problem. So beginning with the beginning, which is Bismillah. Bismillah, as you know, means in or with Allah's name. And we've been explaining this ayat so many different ways. It's amazing. All of the juice you can squeeze out of this lemon. You know, it's amazing. Because uh, the ism Allah is what we're saying. We're just, con it's contracted to be pronounced as Bismillah or Bismillah. Doesn't matter, whichever you choose. Um, but it says so many things to us when we understand that each one of these Arabic letters is already a word. So we don't have to wait until we put two and three letters together to get a word. We have a word as soon as we have a sound. Every one of these sounds coming from the human mouth, B, A, Sa, Ma, that give us Bismillah, every single one of those are already a sound. And because they're a sound, they already qualify as being words. The job of the human intellect is to figure out what these words are actually saying. What is being communicated and from who? Obviously, if it's a scripture, then it's Allah speaking to you. But here's an interesting thing. 
everything that comes into our five basic senses comes in as words. And if they are words, and they are not our words, we didn't invent them. That means that everything that comes into your mind via your five basic senses are words from the source creator. Now, we may not hold them on the same high esteem that we hold revelation like the Quran or like the Christians might see their Bible or the Jews might see their Torah. You know, it's not on that level. That level is so highly organized that it is speaking specifically to your human nature. All of these other things that we're viewing are speaking to your human nature, but they're just speaking to nature. They're speaking to each other. So these things, you know, the birds in the morning that you hear tweet, 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 they're speaking to each other. They don't care nothing about whether you can hear it or understand it or not. So everything in creation is speaking. And we call that the language of creation. And the language of creation has been given to us in a singular word in the Arabic language, in the Qur'an. However, not just in the standard language, but in the Qur'an, when Allah uses the term Arabiya, and they translate it as Arabic, Arabiya is actually the language of creation. It is the language of creation. So if Allah revealed the Qur'an in Arabiya, it means that Allah is revealing secrets about this creation through the study of creation. I hope that's clear. Allah is speaking all of the time to the human being. All of the time. Whether or not we can hear him, whether or not we're understanding what these signs and symbols and things that are coming into our ears and into our eyes are actually communicating to us is up to us. It depends on your level of cognition. So we're going to be talking about cognition today also. If you're not understanding any words that I'm using, simply write them down and re-present them later before we conclude. This is going to be a nice ride. And again, we open up with Bismillah. That means that the B means something. The S sound means something. The M sound means something. The L's in that phrase mean something. And the H the light H at the end of Bismillah. See, it all means something. When you understand what it means, you can more appropriately assign those letters to things that are happening inside of you. Not outside of you, inside of you. Hmm? Yeah, the example of Muhammad himself is inside of you, so says the Quran. Fi Rasul, in the Messenger of Allah. See, Allah speaks about what's inside of him. It's not talking about his blood and guts and bones. It's talking about something that we now call abstract. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. Not only the concrete information that Allah wants us to know by using certain things in creation to, to speak his language and to give you hints and clues as to where he wants you to go, but also... Allah wants us to go beyond just the concrete registration of information. So why is that instructive? Why does Allah, why do we have to get all caught up into this, this abstract thing? I mean, I just want to live. I want to pay my bills. I want to eat food. I want to have fun. I want to marry. I want to have children. You know, what's up with the abstract? It doesn't matter what you want to do. Your brain has been retrofitted for abstract language, whether you understand it, whether you know you're speaking it and thinking it and communicating through it or not. And I've shown you that in the past in several ways, I would say, just pay attention to the average um, sentence that you make. Boy, she's got a cold heart. That's a cold hearted woman, son. Don't, 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 don't bring her to the house anymore. Really? What, what, did her, what did his son do? Take her heart out of her chest and put it in the refrigerator? Or what do you mean by cold hearted? See, that's an abstract statement. Those are symbols that are being used. You understand? So that's true for practically any statement that we make. Not just particular statements. That's true for just about any statement that we make. 
I'm as high as the moon. Really? <laughs> That's a hell of a drug. You, you got to, you're as high as the... No, it's a matter of speaking. And this is called abstract language. It's called many other things. But abstract is one of the main words that we use to describe when we're saying something that's not physical. And again, your brain has been retrofitted for this language by Allah. Doesn't have anything to do with prophets and messengers and people coming to you and saying, I'm coming from God. It doesn't matter. Human beings from the very beginning of their existence were created to register abstract concepts. Forget about the prophets. Forget about all of the stuff you're reading in religion and in the scriptures and all of that. It didn't come with that. It came with your original package, your original creation. Again, this language, concrete language, so that you could understand the concrete world around you, yes, but also abstract language so that you can get above and beyond what the concrete is suggesting to you. And no other creature on this planet can do that except for you human. So you should just, based on what I've said so far, realize how important, how valuable the human life is. Because it's the life, it's the acknowledgement, it's the cognition of the fact that you can, you can extract higher meanings for things out of the concrete. The horse can't do that. The pig and the ant and the bird and the bee and the flower and the tree, they can't do that. They can only respond to what is physically in front of them. And whatever is registering upon their little brains based on the physical content. Whereas the human being, as I said, he's been given a different level of motivation when it comes to learning. And that motivation has to do with taking him and her out of the concrete world and delivering them safely into the abstract world. And I believe uh, that's clear enough. So we always refer to the Quran to explain what some of you might believe to be unexplainable or what some of you might believe has been left unexplained. When Allah revealed the Quran to Muhammad, it is said that he began with the word read, R-E-A-D, that's how they translate it. But the actual word is Iqra, I-Q-R-A, simple word. Say it to yourselves. Ikra. Ikra. Now this Arabic word, Ikra, keeping in mind what we said about both the concrete and the abstract. The concrete comes first. The abstract follows thereafter. Because you have to think about what the concrete is saying to you before you can abstract the, the abstract. Did I say abstract the abstract? <laughs> if I did, I meant extract the abstract. The ab you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> extract the, ab the abstract is what I'm saying. You have to know what the concrete thing is first. Yeah. If I ask him, why are you going around shooting your mouth off about that? I thought we were going to be quiet about that. You're shooting your mouth off. Doesn't mean that his mouth suddenly turned into a gun or a rifle. No, but you have to have a knowledge of what the gun and the rifle does so that when somebody says stop shooting your mouth off, you kind of get the message. Oh, that's a dangerous thing. See? Yeah. So we have to have a comparative analysis between the concrete and the abstract in order to come into this higher level of understanding that Allah is uh, gently moving us, coaxing us, and evolving us into. So he says, Ikra, 
باسم ربك الذي خلق اقرا they say means read i say differently with the name of your lord who created and i still say differently my translation would be that Allah is saying to the human mind to collect, collect, collect what instructor? What are you talking about? To collect information. That's what the mind has been designed to do. When Allah says Ikra, that's a command to begin investigating whatever the subject matter is. And in this case, the subject matter is matter that we call creation, created matter. Ikra, collect, but not on your own. Not on your own with the signature of your Rabb who created. You have to collect with Allah's signature. How beautiful is that? What does that mean, instructor? <laughs> this is going to be, what does that mean, instructor day? What does that mean? Collect with the name of your Rabb? Yeah. Collect with his signature. Collect with his identity. What does that mean for the human being? That means that anything that your five basic senses come into that does not appear to be signed off on by your source creator. Don't eat from it. Don't eat from that table. Only eat from that which you know in your heart, in your nature, in your soul has been sanctioned by the Most High, the source creator whom the Quran calls Allah and who is called by many different beautiful names in other scriptures and by other people outside of typical scripture. There are people around the planet, ancient people who had names for the Most High that were just beautiful names when they explained them to you. If you take enough time to not be prejudiced and think that everything has to come through the Arabic language, no. People have been struggling to understand the source creator for many, many, many thousands and thousands of years. Allah just happened to give us the best case scenario for a word that is all encompassing. And that word is Allah. But the Allah that the Quran gives us, as I've told you also on multiple occasions, is not the same as the Allah that was in the world prior to the coming of Muhammad with the Quran. We'll talk about that on a different day if you've never heard me speak on that. That was a different Allah. They grow out of the same effort on the part of the human being to understand who this soul's creator is. But there's a limitation on the Allah that the Arabs were believing in when Muhammad brought them the Quran. They saw him as a God, for lack of a better term right now. They saw him as a God, but over other gods. See, he was God, but he had minion gods, 360 of them. When the Quran came, it busted up that misnomer. And it gave us a source creator who... It doesn't depend on anybody else's opinion about anything to do what he does. They gave us a God that in some cases had to depend on humans to make this, uh, critical decisions. But Allah in the Quran is singular and unique. So he, he's not uh, that kind of power in the world. He's not that kind of power that depends on somebody else's power. 
or somebody else's decision making to do what it is he wants to do. He's the doer of whatsoever he wills, according to Al-Quran. So that's the uniqueness of Allah in Arabic, but it still differs from the Allah that the Arabs were used to. They pronounce their God, Allah. The practitioners of the Quran should appropriately pronounce that Allah as Allah. That's it. Allah. So listen to the subtle difference. Allah and Allah. One has what is called a dagger alif, which elongates the vowel by two beats. Those of you who know Arabic, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Those who don't, just be patient and, and pay attention. There's the Allah that we read about in the Quran. Everywhere you read the word Allah, it's always one beat. Regular fatha, vowel, Allah. That's it. Go look for yourself. Then you have the one that they introduced to us as Allah, which has two beats. When I say beats, I'm talking about the extension of the vowel sound. Ah, Allah. See that? Ours, Allah, that's it. Theirs, Allah. And then they, their scholars, stretched it out into three beats and beyond when they invented the Adhan. The Adhan is not in the Quran. The Adhan is an invented instrument of the ancient Arabs who were attempting to bring the deen back to its pagan source back to its pagan beginnings. And they felt that they could do that if they could just get us to stop pronouncing it the way the revelation gave it and pronounce it the way they were used to pronouncing it prior to the revelation. Instructor, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that the name Allah was already here before Muhammad the prophet. Can you prove that instructor? If you were paying attention to what they're telling you, you'd be able to prove it yourself. What was his daddy's name? Muhammad Ibn Allah. That was his name. So his father's name was Abdullah. Abdullah servant of whoever that Allah was. Was it the Allah that's in the Quran? No. That's the paganistic concept of Allah that the Arabs were sharing that they borrowed from religions before them, such as the Hebrews. The language got mixed up and messed up in history and the Quran comes to correct it and to put it back on its proper pedestal. The Jews made the same mistake. They began conflating the word Yahweh with the name Elohim. Yahweh is singular. Elohim is plural. They'll translate it as singular God. But if you get somebody who's true to the translation, they're going to say that in the beginning, multiple gods or many gods created the heavens and the earth. Not just God, many gods. Elohim, him, plural, ending. Just like in Arabic, we have hum, plural ending. So we have to become wiser in our approach to what it is we say we stand on as faith, we have to become more prudent. We have to become more observant, is what I'm saying. We have to become more observant. And in becoming more observant in the day and time that we're living in, we're going to become more and more successful. Why? Why? Because the whole universe is experiencing, right now as we speak, a cosmic shift. Now, I know that goes a little bit deep for some of you. 
But nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that we're going through a shift. And even science tells you that. We're going through a shift in terms of where the sun is uh, positioned in regards to the other planets that we're on, including the Earth. Science is not really understanding it, so they're calling it all kinds of cooling and warming up, and they don't know what to call it. All they know is that something, something's going on. So all of these things are in the workings. And the Quran is the book to explain the reasons for these shifts, which take place in the universe, actually, every so many thousands of years. In our case, every 26,000 years. They're, they're shifting based on their planetary positionings. That's too deep to go into right now. We'll be going into that as soon as we, as soon as we shift <laughs> onto our private uh, webinar channel. And that should be very soon, inshallah. So I'm walking you through this slowly so that you can um, take heed, pay closer attention. Because as much as you pay attention to your mommy, you know, we paid attention to mommy when we were little because we thought she knew better than we knew, right? We thought that if we listen to her advice, we're not going to run into as many problems, as much trouble. We're going to know how to avoid trouble. And we did that because we believed that she did, in fact, know better than we do. And she did. And in some cases, she still does. <laughs> you know, mom's wisdom, we call it. So if we could do that because we believe that a human knew better than we do, then what should we be doing? in terms of advice coming from our source creator who created everything and has a knowledge of every single thing. Not just everything, every single thing. in Adir. Over everything, he has the lock on it. He understands its hidden resources of power, what ignites it, what extinguishes its uh, light? How to ramp up, amp up its light. See, Allah knows that because he created it. And he doesn't depend on anything that he's created to keep himself in existence. He's self-existing. Hard concept to digest if you're a mere mortal. <laughs> That's what we are. We're just mere mortals. So it's difficult. You know, he was always here. He'll always be here. He always existed. He never was a baby. You know, all of these things that the Quran tells us very clearly. You know, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakulahu kufu anahad. Wow. You see? So Allah says, Ikra, to collect. It also means to gather. Why is it meaning this? What is Allah trying to tell us by saying collect or gather? He is speaking to the human being's primordial mind. The human being's primordial mind is a mind that is a hunter-gatherer mind. That's in our genes. Instead of going out to the field and picking corn and whatever else, you know, tomatoes and watermelons and all of that, like we used to, and like many of us still do if you're living in places in the world, but particularly in America, if you're still... Um, you know, like the Amish of Pennsylvania, you know, these are people who have stayed connected to the earth as all of us should have. But instead of doing that now, we go and pick those same groceries, those same vegetables and those same fruits, but we do it at the Walmart now or some other fancy dancy overly costing uh, place. 
when we pay much more than if we had simply farmed it ourselves, because now you got to pay for the packaging. See, you got to pay for the transport. Some of those things come from Argentina, you know. Would you have ever experienced that Argentinian, that Argentinian food if you had been growing your own food in your yard? No. Not unless somebody brought it from Argentina, but then they'd have to have some sophisticated way of preserving the integrity of the fruit and vegetable. See? So you would have never experienced that. You wouldn't have known about bananas if bananas didn't grow in your part of the world. And just times whatever that is based on what other food you're thinking about. You would have never known anything about it if you were the agrarian you from you know, 500 years ago, 300 years ago. You would have never known. So due to this phenomenon that as the human being begins to harvest his and her crops, and as inventions such as refrigeration became more prominent in the world, you know, remember these refrigerators that you find in your in your kitchen right now, that wasn't always here. Once that was invented and they made it accessible and affordable for the common people, then everybody who has a house now has a refrigerator. Hmm? And because we have refrigerators, we can maintain our food much longer than if we had uh, just left it to the fitra, if you will. Because the fitra is only going to give you a certain amount of time before you can eat that fruit and benefit from its nutrition. Now we can just freeze it. Or we can cool it and stave off some of the damage that would be done ordinarily if we had left this fruit or this vegetable out in the field. I'm saying all of this to you because I know in the future there are going to be some of you who do a meticulous study of what I'm saying right now and you're going to have aha moments when you do. Everything has a limited shelf life. Listen to what's being said here. Everything in creation has a limited shelf life. And the human being comes along and he artificially extends that life. So if it were just us in our basic vitro form, with what we have accessible to us in the vitro that Allah created, not that man created. Now, we're not where man is creating yet. We're talking about what Allah created, that man goes out into the field and he says, wow wonder what this tastes like. And he tastes it and he loves it. And he begins to gather it. You get it? He's a gatherer. He's a collector. That's what he does, essentially, him and her. When he started hunting, he started going for the bigger game, the buffalo, the bison, and so forth. And so, and he left the woman in proximity to the home because he had to go way out to do his hunting. She was left in and around the house to collect or to gather the berries, the smaller fruit, the smaller game, whatever that was. She could probably catch her a raccoon. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so she was gathering the smaller fruits. So they say that we came from a hunter-gatherer history. Not initially, but this is a stage in man's development. And you know how I know it wasn't initially that human beings were hunter-gatherers? Which also means that in the beginning, human beings might not have been uh, meat-eaters. When the human became a, a hunter-gatherer, he was going for bigger game, as I said, like the bison and the buffalo and these bigger animals that it took more than one person to catch and bring back home. So when he didn't have the social structure to support his moving about in groups, I believe that the first social structure for humans was just him, her, the children, and maybe a couple of close people to them that they called eventually a tribe. 
but it doesn't mean that the tribe was familiar with the next tribe down there around the corner from the mountain or across the river. doesn't mean that they were familiar with that. So I don't believe that humans started out as hunter-gatherers. I believe they started out as individual pockets of people uh, who had to get used to being around each other. They had to get used to um, uh, not fearing each other, not fearing that this one is going to take what I have. These things are hard to come by. He can't just come and snatch what I got. Now I got to start all over again in the field. I have to protect myself. So early humans started coming up with ways to protect themselves. We call them weapons. They're still here, right? <laughs> but early man, now he didn't have the Winchester that was invented to, to hit people from long range. But he had his tomahawk. You know, you had a little slingshot or whatever it was, you know, try and catch you before you catch him. Think about what's being said here. What I'm explaining to you is the evolutionary development of human society. It's evolutionary. That's one part of what the word Rabb means. R-A-B-B. Ikra bismi rabbi ke eledi khalaq. Collect, gather with the permission of your rabb. Rabbi ke eledi, the one who, the specific one who. Khalaq. They say created. I say programmed. Yeah. It's so beautiful when you understand it. Now. Alaq al insana min alaq. Yes, Hutz is correct. He's saying that no hammer and chisel built some of these structures of the past. Yeah, but we're not saying that human society began in one place. That's the other misnomer. That human society all began in some central location and uh, it started out with a human scratching his head, not knowing what to do and learning from there. But if you believe that... Uh, these ancient pyramids and these ancient structures just kind of poofed out of nowhere. You're also mistaken. Every life form has an evolutionary set of instructions to follow. Some grew faster than other societies. Some of them had help from, from places, I believe, other than Earth. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get spooky on you. But you got to understand there are some points in history where the human being advanced dramatically on this earth in a very short period of time. They try to blame it on certain kinds of man, that kind of, you know, Diluvian man and uh, this man and that man and the missing link. You've heard of that one. OK, after the missing link period, uh, just a few years. The humans began to really build. Okay, no, no, no. Sometimes they had help from other places. Human being is still getting help from other places. I don't want to sound spooky and, and scare any of you, but there's life out there. Yeah, there's life. I told you in the Quran, there's life out there. Man fi samawati wa man fil ard. Whatever is in the skies and whatever is in the earth does glorify Allah. So it's not just... Um, so-called foreign life out there. We're so busy looking out there. Allah said there's foreign life in the earth under you. Science is proving it every day, but they're keeping that information secret. But we're living in a day and time where everything has to be made open. Everything has to be made clear. And you're going to be finding out that there are sciences that have been held secret by the top of uh, NASA and these other organizations of this planet. They have kept those things secret and have refused to tell the average human 
what's going on. But Allah says, in spite of the fact that they don't want to tell you, I'm going to tell you what's going on because I have set my creature on an evolutionary path of development. He has to evolve because I have another plan waiting for him after he exercises his, uh, um, the fullness of this particular scheme. And I call it a scheme, not in a bad way. If I build a car, I have to have a scheme. They call it a schematic, a blueprint. So if you're building a house, if you're building an automobile, you have to start with a certain framework. They call it a framework. And if you don't have that framework, you're not going to um, be able to complete the building of that creation. So I don't care whether you're talking about a pyramid or 100-story building in Babylon somewhere. I don't care what you're talking about. It didn't start out like that. Why do you think Allah gives you the blueprint in the Quran that he created you from dust? Then from something called Nutfa that they translate as sperm. And then he gives you uh, he gives you seven progressional steps to lead to that ultimate creation. And he doesn't tell you what that ultimate creation is because it is forever evolutionary. It doesn't stop. Will humans be able to fly one day? Maybe. I don't know what's in the human potential. I don't know what Allah put in that DNA. You wouldn't have thought 50 years ago, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, that human beings would be in an airplane flying around. You wouldn't have thought that. Now, that's common knowledge, isn't it? But if you had told somebody that, that we're, we're going to develop a craft or something that's going to be able to traverse the earth at a much faster speed than an eagle, people would laugh at you. But here we are. Rocket ships, forget airplanes, rocket ships. All of that potential was put into the evolutionary design of the human gene. Yeah, the human gene. It was put into him. He didn't get it from scripture. He got it from his own genetic <laughs> unfolding of his potential. Allah speaks about that jinn traversing the earth, doesn't he? It's in the Quran. What I'm telling you is in the Quran. He would go but so far and then he'd get beat back because what's in his jinn potential is less than what is in his human potential. Gin potential is just excitement, you know, being doing it just for the excitement of. Human potential is doing it because it's going to help that many more humans. So Allah lets it come into being because it's going to be fruitful and rewarding to much more than Harlem, you know, that kind of thing, much more than uh, Rome. But we've been on this evolutionary journey, as stated. And that's what makes the human being so unique. And so beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know many of you think God hates humans. You got tricked into believing that by misreading the Bible. God was angry. They keep messing up. I'm going to destroy it all. <laughs> well, instruct, isn't that what the Quran is saying too? You know, Noah and, the, you know, these guys up here, you know, Allah wiped everything off the back of the earth and that. See, that's because you're thinking concretely and you're not yet thinking abstractly. What about all of these wars, instructor? Thousands of people died. Thousands of people have died because they believe God told them that that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, yes. Ahmed Hassan, he said, scheme and scam. Yeah, it's the same word. And scan is not a bad word. Depends on what you're scanning. You scan your groceries when you leave before you leave the supermarket. Why? Because you want to see their total value. And that's exactly what a scheme does. It shows you the total value of the thing that you're working on, the thing that needs to be completed, what's left out. Sometimes you run all the way back to the supermarket because you forgot that uh, tomato sauce that your wife said, hey, I'm trying to make some spaghetti here. You forgot the tomato sauce. You got everything else, but you forgot the tomato sauce. See? 
because you weren't scanning. You didn't have all of your groceries where they were supposed to be before you were able to scan them and say, yeah, I'm going to go item line. One, two, she got there. I got this. I'm, oh, I'm ready to go home now. See? Human being has to come home also, but he ain't coming home without his scanner. <laughs> We're showing that he got everything Allah told him to go get. And the greatest thing that Allah asked the human to get is human excellence. This is wonderful. Now, Ikra bismi rabbi kerledi khalaq. Read with the identity of Allah, of your Rabb. He doesn't introduce himself as Allah in the Quran. He introduces himself as Rabb. What is this R-A-B-B? -B? Rabb. The letter R in Arabic called Ra. R-A, Ra. -A -Ra. It means movement, fast movement. And it also means evolutionary movement, meaning if you keep moving like this, you're going to move out of this stage into a higher stage. And that higher stage is going to afford you the ability to exist as a life form above those forms that cannot come into this level of appreciable advancement. So Ra, look at how it's used in other Arabic words. Look at how it's even used in English words. Ride, run, rip, river. They all have to do with movement. Bird, car. They all have to do with movement. Ra, means movement. The Arabic glyph for Ra is a sickle, if you know what a sickle is. It's like the crescent moon. That's Ra. What is that crescent moon going to do eventually? It's going to continue growing. See? It's going to grow. So it's not just movement. That's why we say evolutionary movement, because that life form is in the process of growing and increasing, evolving. And then the bait means house. It actually means anything that empties, fills up, empties, refills, <laughs> and does that perpetually. That's why they say house. Bait is house. In the fitrah, it's what I just said. Because in the fitrah, there was a time when there were no houses as such. Not even the projects. <laughs> See? So it's the evolutionary movement operating within not just one house, not R-A-B, but within two houses, R-A-B-B. -B. What are those two houses? Those two houses are called involution, meaning how things are becoming involved to bring about a particular end to that involution. I'll give you the best case scenario for understanding what I'm saying, and it'll be as clear as a bell. When sperm meets ovum inside of the mother's belly, the butun, another B word, because it's a house. When sperm meets ovum in that environment, there's no baby yet. Where'd the baby come from? That little protoplasm, that thing, that connecting thing. That attaching thing, that alaq, where did that alaq, where did the sperm, where, where the, you know, just go back to the beginning. Where, where did the nutafa, the sperm, where did it come from? Came from the man, okay. And when it connected with the female's ovum, 
who is that that's deciding that it grow from uh, embryo to, to, you know, whatever is going to be after that, to fetus? There's embryo and it's embryonic development. And then there is the growing fetus that becomes more and more identifiable as a human child inside of her belly. But it doesn't look like a human child when it first gets here. The sonogram, the sonogram is clear about that. That ain't no human, right? That looks like a frog. It looks like a tadpole. You got all kinds of ways of, of saying what that is. It has to continue to grow. It's growing out of involution, meaning a form that is not yet concretized. This is a form that is not yet made material. It's not yet crossed over the line between that which is invisible, involutionary, into that which becomes expressed as evolutionary. And it doesn't become expressed as evolutionary until it crosses over. See, what you have to understand is that when Scripture starts telling you about episodes supposedly in history, like the crossing over of the Jordan by the ancient Hebrews. It's not talking about some land out there in Israel. It's talking about the crossing over that I'm telling you about right now. The crossing over of the involutionary life form into the evolutionary life form. That is the promised land. That is the destiny to be born into the world and grow into the fullness of your human potential. But you have to begin as an evolutionary being, that bait. And then you have to evolve into an evolutionary development after being delivered across the river. It's very, very wet at that time with water, ambiotic fluid, and blood. You've heard of the Red River that Moses had to cross over. Yeah, the river of, they said the river turned into blood. And here comes the baby saved from Firaun. <laughs> from all of the things that would have taken it out. And now it is another creation. Thumma. Uh, uh, uh. Pardon me, I'm forgetting the phrase. If anybody remembers, just tell me. Thereafter, another creation. That's what we're looking for. Thumma chalikin achar. That's it. Thumma chalikin chalak. See, chalikin achar, akhira. This is your akhira. That's not all that's to be said about that, but that's enough for now. Thereafter. It just means that which comes after. All right? Now, Ikra wa rabbukal akram. This is the second ayah. Ikra wa rabbukal akram. How many times has Rabb been mentioned? See, Allah is giving you hints all of the way through this thing. He's giving you hints and clues. He just got finished saying Ikra. Why he got to say it again? He said, Ikra bismi rabbi ke ledi khalaq. Khalaq al insan. Why does he say khalaq again? He just said it. This is what I mean by the difference between your mundane human language <laughs> and Allah's communications on from on high. So, Ikra bismi rabbi ke ledi khalaq. Right behind him saying khalaq, he says, khalaq al-insana min al Why? Because this is another layer of human that he's creating in this one called al-insan. The first reading has nothing to do with you, the human. Ikra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. It just has to do with created matter. Khalaq, he created. The second one has to do with us. Khalaq al-insana. Oh. From what? Min 
And uh, is that all he's created from? No. The word min does not mean that that's the totality of his creation. It means uh, something from uh, in alaq, an attaching substance, an attaching, they say, clot of blood. Doesn't mean clot of blood. It means that which has an attaching component. And to be an attaching component, you have to be somewhat sticky, don't you? In creation, I'm not talking about hammer and nails, that's man's. Don't, but in creation, if you're going to attach, you have to have some kind of sticky substance to be able to attach yourself. See, this is a beautiful thing. So, so, now Allah is giving you the meaning for alaq and for al-insan. What is it about the human being that allows him and her the ability to attach? Now you're getting it, see? If I say, yeah, I'm attached to that girl right there, I'm stuck on Susie, right? You know what that means? It's an abstract statement, isn't it? Yeah, if you're stuck on her physically all of the time, that's a problem. She can bring you up on charges, my man. Be careful. Stop being so touchy-feely when you're around her. You don't own her. But that's not what the Quran is saying when it says, created the human being from an attaching substance. Allah wants you to start looking at the substances in the development of the human being that are attaching themselves to other things. And once you understand the concrete message, the concrete message is the clot, so-called, of blood. That's the concrete. You have to start with the concrete. And then you have to advance yourself to the abstract. Now, what does that attachment mean on the abstract level? I think you can figure that one out for yourself. That one has to do with proximity. How far away you are, or actually in this case, how close you are to the next person. When we say, I love you, man, I, I can't live without you, that's proximity. That means I always want you with me. I want to always be married to you. I want to always be this family, the father of this family for you and for them. I will not break away from my commitment to you. That's an alak. That's why they say leech-like clot. You got the leech. It's so hard to pull a leech. You got to really pull. You almost rip your skin off pulling a leech off of your skin. So that's your alak. That happens in the womb of the woman when that developing life form actually and literally attaches itself to the side of the uterus in the woman. But it's much more than that. It's talking about your emotional self. You meet somebody, you're not attached yet. You barely know his name. You start talking to him, walking with him, sharing ideas. Oh, really? You're into that also? That's what, that's what I do for, for a hobby. You do that for a living? Wow. <laughs> Maybe we should see each other again a development in the womb of the relationship. You get it? Abstract. So, خلق الانسان من علاق Created al insana from an alaq. So whatever al insana means, it has to do with attachments. The human being as al insan is not what the human being is as an nas. The ins comes first, and nas comes secondarily, and al insan is the crowning achievement of that 
level or group of levels of your development. And NAS is not at it ends, first of all, the ends is not as attached. That comes from a root that means to become familiar with something. That's what happens first. I have to familiarize myself with you. See if we have anything in common. After a short period of time, this is humanity growing, not just an individual. This is the human life, the human being growing on this planet as an evolutionary life form. First involutionary, then evolutionary life form. And he grows into Nas, the nosy one. First he's ints. Inson. Ints. The letter noon, the consonant, and the letter seen, consonant, are both given no expression in terms of a vowel. It's just ints. That's it. No, 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 nah, no, 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 seen. No, 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 no. No vowel. Just raw, it's that's what the human life is in its infancy on this planet. Once you know what the noon and seen mean, noon and seen, noon is seed, progress forward for the life form, and seen is the development of the intellect. Seen. It's from a word that gives us the Arabic word sana. Sana has to do with the brightness of the teeth because the teeth are always chewing on something that's also simultaneously allowing for the, uh, just like your, your toothbrush or what they call the miswack in the Middle East, the miswack. Yeah, you just, you know, just brushing it, make sure you get the film off, get stuff that might have got stuck in between the teeth, you know, get that out of your mouth also. And give it a nice, you know, nice shine and maybe even a nice smell, right? Okay, that's sana. Nun, as I said, represents the uh, seed and its propensity for growing into a life form. So if in the word ints, the nun is given no expression, and the scene is given no expression. It means that those two levels of your human development are not activated yet. Instructor, what makes you think you're so right? It's not about me being so right. It's about me paying enough attention to the fitra. The fitra tells me I'm right because this same process happens every time a baby is born. Every child is born ints. Every child then grows once it learns its family members and who its parents are and doesn't know anything about its neighbors yet on the most part. Doesn't know anything about Joe the grocer, the grocer down the block and around the corner. He doesn't know anything about them yet. He doesn't know anything about the butcher shop and the library next to the school that he will eventually go to. He doesn't know what a school is. He's nice. He's nosy. He wants to know what these things are. Mommy, what's that? They don't even say that about people. Daddy, who's... And they'd be looking right at the baby, right at the child. Who's that? I'm scared of him, see, little children, honest, honesty. <laughs> That's them in the nice stage. Boy, if you don't latch on to this learning of the Quran, you, you're just missing out. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> I'm not talking to you who are here. I'm talking to the people who need to be here, who know that we're here and who still don't show up. But they will. I'm telling you, I told you this years ago. Life on this planet is evolving to the point where this level of information, especially pertaining to Al-Quran, is going to be direly in need, in, will be direly in need of it. And it's going to, um, because of this shift I was talking about, it's going to be something that the Muslim world has not yet come into. Not on the most part. The Muslim world lost this particular level of insight and Quranic investigation about 13, 1400 years ago.
just about a hundred and so years, 200 years after the revelation had been completed for Muhammad. They lost this level of scientific investigation. They went up and down, up and down in different parts of the world. And most of the setback was due to the idea that I have to manage this knowledge. I can't share this with them, my enemies over there. I can't tell them what we're learning here of the sciences and the this and the that and the third and what's in the, Allah is showing it to me and my people. So I'm going to cordon myself off. Think about what I'm saying. I'm going to divide myself into sects that Allah told me not to do into S-E-C-T-S, -E into sections. That's what that word means. I'm going to divide myself into sections and I'm going to be the Umayyad and I'm going to establish an empire for me and mine. And then somebody comes along a few years later and they say, I'm going to divide myself into the Abbasids and I'm going to take over where the Umayyads left off because they didn't know what they were doing. They were knuckleheads. And I'm going to make sure that the people who are uneducated never become educated. There will be a core group of us that will become educated. I hope, I hope this is registering on you correctly. See? So, when we began to break ourselves down into sections is when we lost our power. And that's exactly, again, what the Quran says would happen. Do not divide yourself into Shiite, the Quran says, into Shiite, that means sections. Interesting, right? that a people would come along so knuckleheaded after that and still call themselves Shiites. <laughs> yeah, I hope you're not listening to me now. I don't want you to get upset over me talking about your stupidity in history. And just started changing everything, changing everything to fit to their particular paradigm. Oh, I knew it. I knew the Shiites was... No, 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 no. The Shiites, they came first. The guys you follow in the world, they came second. Got to get the history right. So if the Shiites came first and they started making all of these modifications, and then the Sunnis came along and they started making modifications, and the Sunnis came second, it means that the modifications that the Sunnis made were probably much worse than the modifications that the Shiites were making. Hate me if you want to. I'm not here for you. I'm here because Allah said, you got to go do it. I gave you the information, Milal. I just want you to go out there and start teaching. Make your mistakes. It doesn't matter. I'll correct you. I'll, I'll come behind you and, and clean up whatever you mess up. If you mess up. It, 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 this is just a wonderful day for us. So... That also has to mean that what Muhammad was left with as revelation was pure and perfect and involved in no such thing as artificial divisions. I have a book by that name. You should go to my website and order it. No artificial divisions in Al-Islam. La ikraha fidin. See? Beautiful when you understand it. You're not supposed to try to force anybody into anything in this deen. No compelling la ikraha in the deen. There's a much more meaningful message even to that. Listen carefully. The word la means no. Ikraha, that's the word I want to point your attention to right now. And I'm sure some of you have caught it already. Let me ask you to open up real quick and tell me what other word in the Quran, Ikraha, might sound like. Open up your phone real quick. 
Listen to the word. Listen to the sound. Ikraha. Nobody out there knows what ikraha sounds like as a different word in the Quran. Ikra. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate that. I know some of you are just shy. <laughs> right over. And then others of you are like, I think I know, but I don't want to get it wrong. What difference does it make? Nobody knows you. It'd be me <laughs> that they say, well, he didn't know. But don't worry about that. Just go ahead and speak your mind. More Nine times out of 10, you're going to be correct. But that's correct, Zach. Thank you for that contribution. Ikra? It, it, yes. Ikra sounds like Quran. Okay. So okay. now that, that's another word. But it sounds closer to Ikra. Ikra. Huh? Right. Yeah. If you didn't know the difference between the Q and the K, you wouldn't know the difference, right? So Ikra huh? means compulsion, compelling. Fiddin, in the deen. It didn't say with the deen. It said in the deen. These are the subtleties that you have to be made more aware of. Not with the deen. Not mad deen. <laughs> but in the deen. There's a major difference. We won't discuss it today. Just understand. Make a footnote or whatever you call it in your, in your notes. And we'll get back to that. But I want to talk about that ikraha, that compelling, that compulsion. If there's no compulsion in the deen, I want you to think about this. If there's no compulsion in this deen, and the word is ikraha, I-K-R-A-H-A, -A, ikraha, I'm not giving you notes on, on the screen for a reason. I want you to begin to really use your brain to remember these things or on your own, write them down. That's your responsibility from this day on. Then what is this saying? Qaraha. Qaraha, as we said, ikra means to gather, to collect. So what is Allah saying to us in a very subtle way by using the word ikraha? He is saying that there is no gathering in the deen. Listen carefully. This is not Juma or Jamia, that gathering. This is a different gathering. This is gathering by force. So that's the other thing Allah is saying. There's to be no compelling people. Don't let your ideology reflect something that means that it's not their choice, that they have to be this or die. That we're coming to let some heads roll if they don't accept this new religion. Ikraha, ikra, ikra, gather to collect. There's no collection. There's no sectarianism. There's no, you got to be a part of my gang or, or, or leave this block. No, you Christians, you can't live with us as Muslims. Or you Jews, you can't live with us as Christians or Muslims. The same thing that these so-called religions have been doing for, oh, man, can't even name the number of years they've been pulling this trick. And along with one fell swoop of his divine pen, la ikraha fit din, the truth al haq stands out clearly from error. So let those who have faith have faith and let those who do not Allah says, I will deal with them in the end. I will be, and he doesn't say it in any, any harsh part of it. He doesn't say it in any harsh way. He just says, I'll deal with it. You know how the other siblings come home and they start complaining to daddy, you know, daddy, you know what she did when you were gone. And, the, and daddy, oh, well, when she gets home, I'll, I'll deal with her. You go do what I told you to do. <laughs> don't, don't worry about her. Did you do your homework? Did you clean your bedroom? See? Did you take your bath before going to bed? That's what your daddy wants to know. Don't worry about what your sister didn't do. She might have a reason for not doing what she did. Maybe it's the way you presented it to her. Them Christians, them damn Jews. That, that, maybe, maybe it's the way you're presenting your dean to them that makes them standoffish. 
you're blaming it on on them being some kind of na of, of uh, natural enemy. How dare you lie on a law like that? The Jews are our natural enemies. And most of you guys are cousins. What's wrong with you? I'm looking at one on the television yesterday, and I was, is he Arab or is he Jewish? Same nose, same facial structure, physiognomy, all of that. Same skin complexion. <laughs> he, and y'all, you, you know, you call yourselves the cousins, but you, who are you, the Hatfields and the McCoys now? Remember, they used to shoot at each other from behind rocks in the Old West. You're that, you're the, your cousins. What's wrong with you? And you are cousins who have built up such a, 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 a litany of lies trying to justify your so-called superiority over other people that you have yourself counted yourself out of the human race for excellence. By saying you're the best, no one comes close to you. You're the best thing since sliced bread. You're the best thing since apple pie. All of that stuff is what people like to say about themselves. You know why? Because they're operating in the ego department of their human life and development. And the ego doesn't go any higher than the solar plexus that is operating in your, hmm, the area of your belly. The third level chakra. So, min alak created the human being from an alak. Al insan represents two things. It represents the social man. When I say man, I mean both male and female mind. The social man and the thinking man, the social man, and the thinking man. I heard Imam Muhammad say that when he first came into office around 1975, couldn't have been any, no, it couldn't have been any longer than 1976, but I believe it was during that year, 1975, when he first came into office, and he gave us that word inside. I had never heard of it before, but I wasn't reading the Quran. And he said it means the social man and the thinking man, but he didn't say anything more about it. All of these years later, <laughs> which was about 20 years ago when I discovered this, I started thinking on that lesson that he gave. And I said, now, why would he say that an insan represents the social man and the thinking man? And I'm convinced now, Allah knows best, but I am convinced since he had started giving us insight into certain Arabic letters even earlier. Uh, in fact, no, around that same time, 1975, 1976, when he went to Egypt and came back and was breaking down the pyramid and all of these other structures. It was around the same time when he told us that Al-Insan represents the social man and the thinking man. Now, let's look at this very quickly. A farmer, we're talking about the fitra, a farmer, when he or she goes out to farm, as we always say, because we're Nunetics students, which deal with seeds, the farmer has to take seeds. Now, I bet your bottom dollar, I bet you by golly, wow. <laughs> that you have never seen a farmer go out into his farm with one seed. He's taking care of your one seed. He's carrying it out to the soil, you know, that kind of thing. And he takes it, he fills it out into the field, you know, comes back and puts a little water. No, you've never seen a farmer do that. Seeds are always strewn into the field in groups. And the group represents the social nature. How beautiful. The social nature. So the seed letter called the nun, which means seed, in al-insan, 
insan. See, the noon, the letter N gets suppressed, just like the seed gets suppressed. Once you throw it into the field and cover it over with the soil, it is now dampened down. It's, it's uh, suppressed. It's not able to express itself immediately. I'm teaching you wisdom today, today, today. But what is given expression? Sign. Sign. The seen, seen. The letter that means the human intellect. Mm -hmm. That's given expression. In sign. In sign. What is quickening the activity in the intellect? It is the fact that you are grouping together with other people. You are creating a situation for social bonding. For the protection of Quraysh. <laughs> it's the same concept. Alafa, to bind, to bond, to group together, to wrap yourselves around each other. It's throughout Al-Quran in different manifestations. So insan represents the native potential in you that is at first suppressed, just like it is when you're born. As I said, it doesn't really start to express itself until, uh, until mama lets you leave the house as a teenager, or at least maybe a preteen, 12, 13. She lets you start to go to the store by yourself. She gives you a, a list of stuff she wants you. She says, make sure you check it off when you get it. Check it off off the list. And then, and now before you know it, you don't need a list anymore. We're talking about the meaning of Alan San in your personal life and development. So there you go. In San, it's the in intellect that begins to express itself around your teenage years. And then waiting down the line is another noon. Waiting to be activated. It is not yet expressed. In sun. So what noon is that? It is the noon of your pineal glands potential. It is dormant. Your ability to tap into cosmic wisdom is not yet there. You have to be trained in that. You have to be taught, initiated into that. You don't just get that from, you know, looking at stuff with your five sense experience. Your five senses is not what brings you into that. Your dedication to the purpose that Allah created you to fulfill is what brings you into that. And only Allah can do that for you. Reading books, looking at YouTube videos, graduating from the university of, it can't bring you into the expression of pineal gland wisdom that I'm talking about right now. Because this one has to do with intention. So George Soros, sorry, you can never have an activated pineal gland. Bill, what is his name over there? With his poison seeds? Gates, you can never have an activated nothing. You will always be beneath the sincere and faithful people who follow to the best of their ability, the programs of their source creator. They will always be people who only reach the solar plexus level of their development. The third stage, that's it. Root chakra, sacral chakra. Hmm? You get it? And then solar plexus. So they're their soul, they're SOL, they're the sun, they're the king. But on that low level, just on that low level, they can't go any higher than that. They are solid. They are solid people. They are materialists. That's what solid means. And they can't rise any higher because they have an artificial lid placed on top of their development. Allah didn't put it there. They put it there by paying too much attention to the physical, to the material. To the concrete. You getting it now? 
when you go on thinking that your life is mostly material and that you live mostly for material acquisition, material things, it's the material things that you need in order to satisfy this life. And if you don't have the material things, you're lost. You, you, you might as well not live. And many people take themselves out of here because of the devaluation of the life based on their lack of materials. I ain't nothing. I can, I'll never be nothing. I'm poor. I'm broke. I'm hungry. I'm out of doors. I can't be nothing. The world has taught us that. This world has taught us that. Let's continue and finish. So, he created this social thinking being. And what causes the thinking? Being social causes the thinking. We were first in the little hut, we just our family in the tent, and we were scared to go outside. We didn't know what that. We didn't know what that <laughs> lightning and thunder. But we didn't know what that stuff was. So every time it began to, you know, drop, and we see a lightning bolt go across the sky, but oh, the ooga, ooga, booga, get it back in the tent. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? But to get back in the tent, come to where the protection is. The first chakra is about survival. <laughs> Safety. Hey, come on back up. And then as the years progress, Allah puts something in the evolutionary construct of our genes to say, seems like we pretty much have the safety we were looking for. Now let's look for some people outside of our family group and begin having families. <clears throat> So that's the second chakra, the sacral chakra. We begin to think about people outside because you, you, you have an urge in you that Allah placed in you to broaden the family line, broaden, have more babies, and then they become the tribe. See, first there's the family, then there's the tribe. They're not all related to each other, at least not initially. And then they begin to have babies and they stretch out and then you begin to meet people from across the river and over on the other side of the hill and all of that. And then you become uh, a nation. And Allah tells you why he did that. He says that he has not created us as nations and tribes so that we might despise each other, but so that we would become familiar with each other. And Allah uses the term Anas in describing these people. Not al insan Anas. Become familiar with each other on the outward outside presentation. I want to become familiar with those people first based on their outside presentation. What are they wearing and why? They're wearing a lot of fur. <laughs> they must have killed a lot of big animals. Why? We're eating beans <laughs> and toads, <laughs> you know, and crickets over here. Where'd they get that bear skin, that deer skin, you see? So people become curious. So that's the other meaning for li ta'arafu that Allah is using. Li ta'arafu, so we can become curious about each other. That's why Allah did that. That's why he allowed us to incrementally introduce ourselves to people who we didn't know just yesterday or last week. But we know them now because we've been introduced. And now I see that I have something that they seem to be interested in. And they have stuff that we're not familiar with. That Maybe we can have some exchange And again, I'm telling you, the Quran is the absolute best book for understanding the fitrah. You're the fitrah of your own individual growth and development, your involutionary life, and your evolutionary life. It's all packed into what Allah is giving us as wisdom in the Quran. 
because of that behavior I just described about how people meet and greet each other and learn to grow and learn from each other and exchange with each other, that is in the individual child that's born. That's how they make friends. <laughs> it's the same process. I know right now many of you are saying, damn, I, it was so clear. I don't know why I didn't think of that. But because they teach you not to think, Mr. Al Insan. We're trained to not, we're trained to think mechanically. And we're trained, we're, we're over-trained in the material history of people, the physical history. We think the Quran is a book of, of history and it's not. The Quran is the most excellent book on metaphysics that this world will ever have. Doesn't mean that these things didn't happen or did, no, that's not what I'm saying. Life begins in the concrete, but it's a, it is supposed to advance into the abstract. It's not supposed to stay concrete. You don't stay concrete. I gave you that example in the beginning in giving you these different phrases. You can't stay abstract. You can't stay concrete. You have to go into abstract. Like it or not, it's your nature. Now, so Allah says he created us min alaq, created us from an alaq. What is an alaq? They say clot of blood. They say attaching clot. Uh, clot. Ain lam of are the three Arabic letters that are being used for alaq. Uh, but it's the same three letters that are used when you invert them you can get the word Ka la ha kaf lam ein. Now that's not a word, but if you employ the practice and the science actually of exchanging letters for other letters in that category. And in the case of Lam, there's only one other letter. And that's Ra that we spoke about earlier. So instead of Qaf, Lam, Ain, which is not a word, you now have Qaf, Ra, Ain, which is a word. It's the word we began with, Qara'a. Qara'a. And what is Qara'a? They say read. See, we're back to the beginning again, but it means an attaching substance. Now, in order to read, you have to be able to attach letters, first and foremost, in a way that creates words. You have to attach two or more letters together. Can't just be single letters, you know, running around. <laughs> it's got to be two or more letters that make a word, an actual word. So reading, so to speak, involves an attachment. And in order to grow as a reader, what you are perceiving as information has to also stick in the intellect. It has to stick. And we say that to our teachers. It's not sticking. I don't, I mean, I, I, I ran over this how many times today? And it just doesn't seem to be sticking. So it's a slight reference to the nature of the human intellect. And Alaq. I could say more. That's why I'm moving so slow. I'm measuring 
I'm gauging you so that I can continue to engage you. <clears throat> Listen carefully. Ikra wa rabbu kel akram. This is another level of reading. This is reading mentioned twice in the word ikra. But it's not speaking about the same level of so-called reading that the first ikra is speaking to when Allah said, ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. That's the first reading. That's why that that they put a put a period on that. Then he introduces another idea. Ikra wa rabbu kelakra. Read, quote unquote, and your Lord, your Rabb is most generous. You see the, the two B's in Rabb working right there? The first one is in the first statement related to Ikra. The second development is in the second statement related to Ikra. The first one is talking about your involutionary life. Ikra. Your primary involutionary life is locked into your creation. Who created Khalaq? It's locked into the Khalaq. It's locked into the Khalaq. Did you get it? How about that? Then the second one is evolutionary. Ikra wa rabbu kel akram. Read and your evolver. See? Your guardian evolver is most generous. It's the superlative of karma. Akram. That it doesn't get any higher than that. Akram. So where's this generosity? What is this generosity? This generosity is in all of the wonderful, beautiful, fantastic things that grow out of the material, that grow out of the initial programming. My goodness. You bring that brand new computer home and it doesn't have any program. It has programming, but it has superficial programming. Now, I don't want to call it superficial, but it, it has uh, primary, yeah, primary programming. You know, windows, you know, it might not even have windows, right? You might have to put that in there yourself. But it's got some other things. You got the camera, you know, you know, and the, this, this and the, you know, whatever it might have, you know, just some very fundamental, you know, programming, right? But when you juice that thing up and it tell, starts to tell you what you can do and how you download, that's what revelation means in the Quran. It means download. Going slow so you can write these things down and remember them. Anzal al Quran. Nazala. He rained it down. He sent it down. Now, whenever you read that in the Quran, that he sent the revelation down, translated into 2024 language, like I'm giving it to you. He downloaded the Quran. You downloaded it. And then think about what your computer does when it downloads something. You, because you can download a virus. That's what the whole Muslim world practically is now. <laughs> a community of, of, of virus-ridden thinkers or non-thinkers. We got to come out of that. And we will. I believe that. Allah didn't do all of this for nothing. But up until this point, we have been fed so many viruses. Like I said, you know, beginning with the, the, the virus, the worst of them is the virus of the Shia, not the Shiite. Now I'm talking about the Shia, the people who, have, who began dividing up the whole uh, world, actually, but into sections so that they could manage those sections. See, that's a property of the human intellect. It likes to break things down into sections. That's what the intellect does. And it does that so that it could manage it more, you know, easily. 
categorize things. That's what the intellect does. That's the left brain, if you're listening to the science of how brains work. The left brain, it likes to categorize. Put everything neatly into a compartment. Part, see, not the whole compartment. They say the right side of the brain is the one that is holistic. Yeah, it thinks about things as, as groups. The left side begins to differentiate and break things down into in, thing, things down into individual components, both of which are necessary, but you're not supposed to let the left side take control of the whole brain. That's how you get racism. My white is better than your black. My brown is better than your red. That's how you get sexism. Males are better than females. Oh, females are better than males. Let me show you how, mister. Where I come from in the world is better than your part of the world. It's cold over there where you are. Look at how bright and sunny it is over here. God must have favored us. Look, 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 at, the, look at the climate here. Yeah, but look at your life. God, Eskimo's doing better than you. And they, they love living where they live. Eating fish blubber or whatever other diet they, they jump in. You don't see them making a bad, mad dash across somebody's wall, over somebody's wall to get into America. The Eskimos. I saw a so-called black woman the other day on YouTube saying how much she loves. She would not trade in living in Alaska for the world. She loves it over there. And she's all hunkered down you know, with the coat, big old coat that they wear. And all. So there are some people who can get used to anything. How, how beautiful this thing is. All right. Let's move a little faster. And we're going to be finished by 3 o'clock, inshallah. So khalaq is not just creation like a thing that's created. That could be of no value whatsoever. Khalaq represents programming. When you program, how Allah programmed. And the thing has to... Uh, uh, it has to live out its programming. If Allah programmed it that way, it has no choice. Does your computer have a choice? Does it say, I don't want this word perfect thing, this word program. Give me uh, something different. And then it just goes and does it on its own. No, it can't, it can't do anything outside of what you programmed it to do. Yeah, that's right, Ahmed. Black folks are in Iceland and Greenland. Yeah. So understand what we're saying here. That uh, <clears throat> the outcome is dependent on the income. The outcome is totally dependent on what comes in. So, the entire world of creation is a programming system created by our source creator to speak its own unique language, which in the Quran is called Arabiya. Ain ra bait. Ain, insight, the eye. Ra, into the evolutionary movement of. Bait, matter, created matter. Arabia, insight into the movement, the, progress, the progression of material matter. That's what this language is. It begins in the concrete and it extends itself into the abstract. These are two readings. If you want to say that it means read, understand that it means read in the way that I just explained it to you. These two readings, one is concrete, the other is abstract. 
Ikra is the collection of the data that is necessary for both levels of evolution. See, this is a word they didn't teach you. The word involution and the word evolution both contain another English word that they don't want to talk about so much called evolution. Evolution means your choice. He did that of his own volution. And then they also say that it can mean volition, but it's the same word. And in the word volution, volution is also the word love. Because both of those progressions in the human development are due to our source creator's obvious love for us. But if you turn that word backwards, you could also see an allusion to the word evil. And again, it's your volition, it's your volution, it's your choice. This is the great extended freedom that Allah gives to the human being. I'll this is how, it's yes, so yes. This is how you earn your keep. As our parents used to tell us when we get our first job, oh, now you're going to be able to earn your keep. That means if you earn it, you keep it. See? So the entire creation is speaking the language of creation. And Arabia is not simply the language of some Bedouins in the Middle East somewhere, in Arabia somewhere. That's not all it is. That's where it began. That's the concrete template that Allah needs for you to look at so that you'll get the bigger abstract picture once you extend and connect the meanings. So these are two levels of language. From the concrete data that we collect, we develop out of that concrete data the abstract meanings for what Allah is saying. The Rab is the potential for growth, the potential for evolution in these two different areas of concern that we're today calling concrete and abstract. Your brain operates on both platforms. Concrete, once a thing has come out of involution into the real world of matter, and it is what it is. It's a rock. It's a plant. It's an animal. Those are concrete items in the world of matter. That's science. But there's another development that the world of science in the West especially doesn't want you to know about or just doesn't know themselves to teach it to you. And that is, is that that's not the end of your evolutionary journey. To say, I'm here, and I'm a human, and I have sex, and I have fun, and I, you know, have money. And you think that's the end of your evolution? That's not even really the beginning of your evolution. And not as a human thinker on this planet. Not as Alan San. And for as long as we can continue to consciously observe creation and its signs, we can also continue growing, developing and evolving our abstract understanding. So if you allow the involutionary side of you that's coming into more and more understanding of the material world, things are beginning to concretize for you right here. This is where things become concretized, made concrete. That's when you say, oh, I get it now. I understand what to do. Yes, boss, I know now. Now I know what you mean when, I, when you said to take this over there. Yeah, I meant that physically buddy <laughs> pick that up and take that all the way over there and do that 50 times a day for your pay that's what i want you to do i don't want you to think i don't want you to read i don't want you to interpret i want you to just do what i told you to do on the material level that's the first step And when you do that correctly i'm going to move you up to the point where you're no longer exchanging you know items on a shelf you're exchanging money in the bank. So you just keep growing is the point. From this position to that position to the third position. Just like plants do. 
in the field. And then when they grow so high that they can no longer grow, that if you leave them in the ground, if you leave them attached to the ground, they're going to retard. This is human life Allah is talking about. They look pretty when they first come up. Oh, here comes the corn. Here comes the wheat. Here comes the barley. Oh, man. But you have to wait for it to mature, just like you do your children. Once it is mature, you let them suckers stay in your house and they're 20-something years old and 30 years old. They're still living with mommy. See what happens. You're going to have a bunch of retarded children. I don't mean clinically retarded. This has nothing to do with shaming anybody's retarded relatives or anything. I have a brother who's retarded. There's nothing, and he's better than most human beings I know, including myself. <laughs> Are you talking about them? I'm talking about the ones who are choosing retardation. Retardation is a, is a, a word out of the fitra referring to vegetation, that's all. When vegetation stops getting the proper oxygen and the proper nutrients from the soil and the proper sunlight, and the, when, when human beings stop getting that, they begin to retard. Because they haven't been harvested. What is harvest? Harvest means that they now have to take on the challenge of competing in the market. That's a challenge. I'm coming out of the field with everybody who looks like me. That wheat next to me looks like me. The other one is grandma. She down there. She looks like me. The other one is cousin Bobo. He looks like me. But then we all get harvested. We get pulled out of our security. Mm -hmm. That pocket that we're stuck in. We get pulled out of that. And if we don't get pulled out of that, we're going to die. So they pull us out and then they put us in the barrels and they take us to the farm and then the farm begins to, you know, separate us into categories of qualities, A, B, C, you know, whatever. And then you go to off to the market. And when you go off or you go to somebody's dinner table, but you go to the market. See? And in the market, they got categories of many other things to choose from. And now you have to compete with those many other things that people can choose from, choose to spend their money on. And if you are of good quality, they will choose you. If you sit next to another one that looks like you, and it's your cousin Bobo, and he don't look that, uh, you know, green enough, uh, or he's still, still too green, or he's beginning to rot, they're not going to choose Uncle Bobo. They're going to choose you. This is human life we're talking about. Lastly, all life is produced from a cell. All life is also produced from a core. A cell is C-E-L-L. -L. L is interchangeable with the word R or the letter R. So C-E-L-L -L is also C-O-R-E, core. Don't pay attention to the vowels. We're talking consonantal connections. Cell, C-E-L-L, -L, and core, C-E-R-E, -E, are speaking to the same fitra-based phenomenon that all things begin their growth and development in the center, in the middle, in the core. This is what science tells us in biology, physiology, physiognomy. They all tell us that the initial spark of human life in the mother's belly that begins to grow that creature out of involution into eventual evolution once it's delivered from the womb. My oh my. The first organ to develop is the human heart produced in gestation while it's still in the mother as an embryo the heart in the sonogram you can see it
and the word heart. You know, in Spanish, we say corazón, cor, cor, corazón. It's the middle. The word heart itself, with the H being a guttural, is H-R and then the tad marbuta, I call it, the, the feminizing T on the end of heart. So, but it's really just H-R. H-R, heart, H interchanges with the C or the K sound. See? The C is either S or K. If I say corazón or cor, then it's the A, it's the uh, K, pardon me, the K-R. Core. English is so tricked up that if you don't know the rules and how to break the rules to get the essence of the information, you won't get it. So Allah says that he created us min nafsan wahida from one central soul. See, the SL, SL is CL, CL is KL, KR, KL, and it, it's the same concept. Oh my goodness, Consonental Connections is here to stay. From a Negro. This is our inheritance. And I don't mean inheritance like racial inheritance. I mean inheritance like systematic, historically justified <laughs> inheritance. And if it's coming to you and you're not an African-American, I say so-called because that's a made-up thing too. But if you're not an African-American, but it came to you, it's your inheritance too. That's the beautiful thing about this is not dealing with what color you are or what background you happen to be from. Because our circumstances are not really racial in that sense. You got some people right now making billions of dollars on this planet who are darker than me. Some of them are in our government. Darker than me. Still trying to get me to, to play race politics. Black man, black man, black woman, you know. Some say we're gods, you know, all kind of foolishness. Some say give us a break, you know, 400 years of slavery and, you know, and 100 of those years, Jim Crow, 50 of those years, at least Jim Crow. We should be crying. The white man owes us. We're the white man's burden. Man, if you keep seeing yourself in that little dim light, you are through in this day and moment of exchange and in this moment of shifting. I'm talking about shifting energy, shifting frequencies. You're going to be swept out. You're going to be out of the picture altogether. I'm talking about the race baiting people. I'm not talking about the people who have legitimate claims and legitimate gripes. I'm not talking about them because they're being treated badly because of the complexion of their skin or their gender. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the ones who have made a living off of just complaining. You ain't free yet. And if you ain't free after all of these centuries, how in the world can you be superior like you talking you are? Black man is God. But you can't, you can't, you can't make any progress after 500 years of this stuff. The white man must be your God. I'm sorry, I got to jig with you a little bit more. He must be your superior. Chains off the hands. That's all you should have needed. Stop chaining me. Let me go out. Let me, you know, make my own plan. I can buy me some land. I can do this. I can do that. I can be inventive. I can invent something. I'm listening to the stories of people from overseas, from China. Woman escaped from China, became a politician in, in, the, in, in the United States with nothing. Raised thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, just because of the appeal of her message. She's Chinese. I think she was running, not for president, but some high office somewhere. She was, I forget her name. I just found out about her yesterday. But well, she's doing it. She didn't win. But give it 2028 and see what happens. 
That's what I mean by shifting frequencies. By 2028, you might have a, an Asian president who's an American. It's going to rock your world if you're still in, 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 in Black Lives Matter territory. It's going to rock your world what's about to happen in the next three to four years and after. You have to learn the strategies that are employed by Allah in the Quran to bring humanity to where he wants you to be. It doesn't matter what you want. It's where he wants you to be as a humanity. And those who don't want to get with the program, the great elimination. Why are you making God sound so cruel, instructor? No, I'm not making God sound cruel. That happens in your system every day. This system, the body system, it happens every day. When, when you have sex, how many sperm are ejaculated? How many make it? Maybe. Right? One, maybe two. Split and become fraternal twins or, you know, whatever other kind of twin. But that's rare. Most of the time, it's just one. And then what happens to all of the other sperm? They got to return to sensual. What do the white blood cells do in your body when there's an invader attacking your red cells, your healthy red cells? The white cells go out for bloody murder. The white blood cells are gangsters in your body. It sees a cancer developing someone, they will go out and they see, oh, they're corrosion off the area, just like the popo do, corrosion off the area, and they will go, they will obliterate that cancer. They will put enzymes and other things into that thing to make it explode like somebody threw a bomb at it. And they themselves will die. The white blood cells, they sacrifice themselves so that the greater body, the greater good continues to live. Isn't it beautiful? That's our laws where I don't know what you're thinking about. That's Allah's way. And it doesn't always have to be on the physical level. I told you, it begins with the concrete and it advances to the abstract. Today, that's happening, but it's happening with ideas. Allah gives us the concrete to give us the template, but it doesn't mean he wants us to go out there and obliterate millions of people because in your system, he obliterated millions of germs. That's the template. The human mind has been created to evolve above the level of the concrete. And once you get the message, then you're able to take the message and apply it to the bigger idea. How do we save ourselves and our families from the fire? That's the bigger idea. He didn't say burn yourself down, burn the town down, burn the city down. He said save yourselves from the fire. That's what we're all about. What's the most effective and efficient way of putting out this fire? So we're talking about that which is responsible for the core life of the human being. Your core life. Your cell life. Your cellular life. All KR words like core and SL words like cell, they have to do with an exchange that is designed to protect the integrity of something. So your soul is designed to protect the integratedness of your life. How your life is many things, different things, but how they are integrated into one thing. Designed to do what? Take you forward along the path to reach that objective that Allah created for you. What is that objective? It's called Jannah. Paradise. Where, instructor? Right here where you are, right here. See, you're so busy looking for heaven, you know, in the by and by that you're forgetting that Allah created the earth to be your heaven. He says that in the Quran and in the Bible. He created the earth to be your first step, first stop on the train towards Jannah. 
in the Quran, they call al warithin the inheritors of what? al ard the inheritors of the earth. That's where your per paradise begins. So you're supposed to use all of that brain power not to just protest somebody's bad treatment of you. You're going to always have bad treatment in the world. Life is full of paradoxes that you have to overcome, that Allah gave you the strength to overcome. But you have to do it in a way which begins to eventually carve out a, a, a path for your righteousness. You have to carve out a path for your own righteousness. You're not to say because the world is wicked, I just have to, you know, get along, to, you know, go along to get along with the wicked people by being wicked myself. No, you've lost the race when you do that. You have to say, I don't care if 100% of these people are doing wicked stuff. I choose righteousness. All right, instructor, you might die choosing that righteousness. Then I'm dead and I'll move on to my greater glory. The paradise that you keep thinking about. If I did all that I could do in this life to achieve righteous behavior, righteous thinking, helping other people, whether I know who they are or not, whether I speak their language or not, and I do the best that I can, and I die doing it, I am in a, a real heaven then. I'm supposed to be scared of that? Why would Allah create something that most humans are going to be scared of? The fact that most humans are afraid to die tells me that they don't know what heaven really is. They don't understand life because you've been tricked by the people who designed this fake world. If you knew what the Jannah, the heaven, and all of that after you physically leave, if you knew where that was, you would, you would take yourself out of here, but you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> You'd sit around and say, I'll just let this expire. <laughs> I hate this world. If you knew what the real world was, you'd say, let me find a way. But there is no way. You have to wait till the clock winds down on this life. And in the meantime, work to establish your righteousness, even if it's in a small nook and cranny of this world. But there's many more opportunities than nooks and crannies in this world. There are many more righteous people ready to stand with you in this world. Start with your family. If your family don't want to get with the program, find a neighbor who's thinking on the same level as you. Stop being so soft, men. Acquiescing. My best friend was messing around with his best friend's wife. I'm gonna mess around with my best friend. Go ahead and go. You get 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 diddy, <laughs> get the diddy disease if you want, and see what happens. You see, all you gotta do, Allah gave you a template. I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen to you. I'm gonna put one guy in front of you for now. There's really many of them, but they're gonna highlight one guy. It's called Diddy. <laughs> I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen to him. Right. He thought he was getting away with it all. And he was being supported by some people that you would say, what? If you knew who they were in government, in economics, George Soros and these people being supported by that level of support. And they think they're getting away with it. No, Allah is rounding them all up as we speak. Epstein, all of them. You say, well, he's dead. Well, they have yet to prove that to me. <laughs> but they're rounding up all of them. And some of the innocent are being taken with them. There's some who have repented, who might not, maybe they will, but who might not be taken with them. Because Allah accepts repentance. If you come for real. Well, who's going to judge that? Me or Allah. At any time, they can stop and say, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I've seen enough signs. And I'm going to start working for, the, for the, the, the good side. They can do that. And I can't be mad at them. That's what happened in, uh, yeah, I think it was Eunice, in his day, you know. Eunice was mad. He said, Bob, you said you were going to take these people out of here. And he said, I also told you that if they repented, I'd leave them alone. Give them another chance. 
So it's not up to us to decide who's going to hell, you know, who's going to heaven or who gets another chance. That's not up to us. Anyway, that's enough ranting. We're talking about protecting the integrity of things. Protecting the essential nature of things so that those things in nature can grow to be nurtured. That's what we're dealing with. So I'm going to end here and we're going to pick up on this conversation, inshallah. This time next week, but it might be a different uh, link. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a different link on a different, uh, what do you call these things, networks? Yeah, we'll be moving on to our own network, I guess you can call it. Platform. Platform, thank you. Thank you. I always had a problem with the network. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, we'll be moving on to our own platform, so stay tuned. I know I'm moving a little bit slow like Uncle Joe, but don't worry about that. I'm a one-man machine over here. <laughs> and I got some good help from my friends out there in Unetics land. They're helping me technologically speaking and in many other ways that I'm so thankful for. But I'm trying not to move too far ahead of myself so that I don't make a misstep that I have to now come back and correct. So if I say I'm going to do something by next week and it doesn't happen, just say that's Instructor Bilal. We know how he is, but we know he's working on something powerful. And I am powerful. Instructor and trying, Bilal. Yes. I'm sorry, Robert. When you get a chance, I just want to ask you one question if you don't if you have time. Go right ahead. About the Shia Shiite being before Sunni. Yeah. Could it be possible that the Sunnis were correcting the Shiites by coming up with a different way of looking at it or not? If that was the original intent, they failed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. and they failed miserably see what happens you fail when you start to bring individuals in who you begin to give them too much credit as a human being you begin to say god is with the, you know it's all they all dealing with levels of, of symbolism the other thing that came into islam that people are not aware of or don't give much credence to is the fact that they began to be severely influenced by masonry by the Freemasons, wow. by by esotericism, okay, okay, big time influenced by esotericism. So before you know it, the twelve imams, where did that where that come from? Came from the same place that the twelve who followed uh, Moses, the twelve okay. tribes came from. The Quran comes, and it gives you tribes also but it's correcting the picture that was left in the fake version that came before it. So now you can measure what the Quran is saying about 12 or about the tribes against what the world has told you about the tribe. The world told you that there were 12 sons of Jacob. The Quran says there were 12 children of Jacob. What's the difference? Male and female. That's right. Not all of them had to be male. That's how Allah makes his, for people who are paying attention, that's how Allah is making his corrections. See, so we think the Quran is saying, oh, the Quran took that from the Bible. No, it didn't. You got to look at the differences that Allah is giving you when he tells you about these stories that in your head sound alike, but to the discerning ear, sounds different. And then you study that difference, and that's where the wisdom is. You got it? Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank Not you. a problem. Not a problem, okay? Yeah, study that Shiite Sunni divide, because that was also following a program and platform that was established, just like the Sufis. The, the, what the Sufis believe has been here for thousands of years before Muhammad the Prophet. Now you say, how can that be when he, uh, Sufis are Muslims, and how could it have been here before Al-Islam? Because they're not following Al-Islam in that regard. They're following an ancient script. Some of what we're following right now, I told you about the, the, the so-called uh, prayers that they call namaz. Namaz comes out of, that's not, it's not out of Islam. It's out of, well, 
<laughs> you know, Zoroaster and the boys, you know, that's, that's from somewhere else. Different God altogether. But they put it together. They said five prayers a day at these times. But that's what the Zoroasters are doing as prayer that they call namaz. How, did, how in the world did we get the name namaz for, from, from Salat? Doesn't make sense. So this is what we're here to do. We're here to bring back sense. Bring back sentience. And speaking of sentience, that's one of the themes in my new book. <laughs> oh my goodness. Our human constitution. This book is so, oh my, it's so powerful. <laughs> It's so powerful. <laughs> and it's only $30 right now. So go ahead and put your order in. The first batch will be in the mail tomorrow. So, of course, the sooner that you order, the sooner you'll get your copy. All right? Just remember, I'm a one-man van over here. And it takes a little bit of time to print and to do this and to that and to buy some more ink. And, you know, it's, I mean, you know, it's just a, it's a production. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like that. I don't know if you've noticed if you've gotten any recent books, but the quality of this paper is the best quality right beneath photo paper. Photo paper, it doesn't make sense to print books on photo paper. But this level of thickness, this 98 brightness and all of that, if you know what I'm talking about, this 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 will impress you if you give it as it will impress people if you give it as a gift like Nawa is doing. If some of you who are buying many books and saying, "Oh, I'm going to be around my family for Thanksgiving, maybe for Christmas and all of that," and New Year, hey, let me use this time to get uh, two or three books. It's only thirty dollars. That's right. It's only thirty dollars. Let me go ahead and oh, let me go ahead and get these books now, so I'll have them ready for my people. How are they going to know about what we're doing if you're not teaching them? You're not even introducing it to them. Shame on you. By now. New people, you get a, you get a, yeah, I give, I give you a pass. People been with me for two and three years and ain't bought a book yet. No bueno. That's not good. That's selfish. So don't do that. Go ahead and put your order in. And you'll see that that $30 that you send this way for this book or for any other book, you're going to watch Allah replace that in your bank account almost in, probably before you send it to me. It will, uh, Hassan knows, it, it will be replaced almost before you send it to me. At least that's how it works for me. I don't know why it ain't working that way for you, but I think it is. Fulfill your fiduciary responsibilities and don't worry. Don't, Allah says, do not fear poverty. He provides for you like he provides, he provides for them like he provides for you. Do not kill your babies. That means your, your important ideas that are in gestation also, not just a physical baby, but do not kill your babies for fear of want. In other words, don't work on, don't, don't stop working on that new idea that you have that you believe might change the, the, the whole scope of humanity's thinking and behavior. Don't stop working on that because you got to work at McDonald's too. Go ahead and work at McDonald's. Save up your little scraps from McDonald's, but keep working on that bigger idea. That's the baby that Allah gave you. That's the one he wants to be born into the world. And at the same time, as I said on my abortion video with my wife, Karima, stop killing your physical babies also. This is not for any of you. This is for those people out there. Stop killing your physical babies thinking, I can't afford. That's really not what most people are thinking. Most people are thinking, I ain't ready to have no family. Well, why did you get with the girl? I ain't ready to have no babies, man. I ain't got no money like that. Well, why didn't you wear something? Why didn't you protect yourself? As the Quran said, how judgest ye? <laughs> how are you judging? We have to turn this thing around. Now. Because what you're going to see manifest between now and December 31st, July for, uh, January 1st, 2025, is some of your heads might rock based on what the plans are. 
There are people in this world who want to hold on to the power irregardless of what happens to you. Matter of fact, one of their major plans is for something to happen to you so that you will amp up the fear of them, hoping that that fear will stave off what Allah wants to happen on this earth, beginning in this country. This country is a pivotal place. Imam Muhammad said once that Satan chose America. <laughs> Listen carefully. Satan chose America as his last stop. Did y'all hear what I said? Shaitan chose America. He went all around the world, disrupting countries and e economies and all kinds of just uh, running rampant through countries and doing devilish, devilish things to people and to whole nations of people. You know, Muhammad said they chose America. You probably heard this yourself in listening to a lot of the political back and forth stuff that was going on during the election. People kept saying, and I heard this mostly from the Democrat side, People kept saying the American experiment. I don't know if you noticed that. They kept mentioning the American experiment. That's a term Imam Muhammad used to use early in his leadership. He said, America is the great experiment. What is that experiment? I'm quoting Imam Muhammad now. He said, the experiment is to let evil rise so high. until you reach your breaking point. They wanted to see how much evil people could take on, and what the breaking point was. What does the breaking point mean? The breaking point means when you can't take anymore. But he also said this, keep this in mind, that the powers of this world, they like to put the pressure on the people, the innocent people, until they, like this woman, uh, my goodness, I just heard this morning, there was some woman, I forget, somewhere in some state, she found out that uh, uh, Trump won the election, and she, and, and uh, I guess her father, or maybe it was somebody who voted for Trump, she bludgeoned him to death. Explain that to me. You can get so angry, politically angry, at somebody, that somebody who thinks a little bit differently than you, you killed them? She got a, a, a saw. She got a, um, she bludgeoned him first with a hammer or something. And then she, man, she started biting him like she was eating him. I'm telling you, tides are shifting right now. Vampirism and other things that you might have thought you knew about, these are, they, they are, these witches and these warlocks are coming out full time now. And when the police got there, she was sitting there laughing. Blood all over her mouth and over her clothes. She was laughing. I have some theories on that that I'm not going to share all of them with you right now. But I will say this. And y'all can take this like you want it and call it misinformation, disinformation, whatever you call it. I believe. <clears throat> that there was something in those vaccines. I don't know if y'all heard that. There was something in those vaccines that was intentionally designed to have certain people go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Now, I can't prove that, so I'm not going to push it. And I don't want you to push it. It isn't just me and you talking right now. There was something in those, there was either something in the vaccines and or if you know anything and you need to do your homework before I see you again on what's called MK Ultra, the two letters, M K Ultra, U-L-T-R-A, study, uh, what was the movie? Denzel did it last. Uh, anybody know that movie? About MK Ultra. You talk. You talking about the uh, where they inject into the people uh, microchips to to uh, program to control them. That's one of them, but the other one was just a psychological program. 
it's it's psychological. Anyway, I'll, I'll remember it and I'll send it in the, in the uh, in the video. But the point is, is that they can program people just through the constant repetition of words. And they're, they're actually literally programming people so that your brain becomes sensitive to certain words that trigger you. These the words, Manchurian candidate? There you go. The Manchurian novel to the rescue. The, the Manchurian candidate. There's an original version, and then there's the version with uh, Denzel. Any of them, both of them are good. But you'll see what I'm talking about. And then the thing is, you just be your normal self walking, and then there's a word that they will walk by you and use. And that one word that they walked by you and used set you off and you don't even realize what you did until after you've done it. And even after you've done it, you don't remember you did it. And that's what these people who are going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, that's what they look like when I'm looking at them. <laughs> Why do you got to get what? What happened? See? I've never seen people get that out of pocket because of some political election or something that didn't go their way or something. I've never seen them act like that or react like that. Like they are just mad. They have, they've been driven to madness. That's not normal. LSD and uh, Timothy Leary experiment with the CIA. Okay. Yes, yes. It, yeah. It's the CIA doing these things. Sahib, did you want to say something? I, I see your phone is open. No, sir. I'm sorry. Got okay. That's okay. Yeah. So, yeah. What are these people doing? What are they working with? And why are they working with it? It goes beyond a particular candidate or something. There's a scheme that's going on. And again, if it's your last ditch effort to stay alive, you know how much you want to fight to stay in existence. So don't think because there's a cooling down period and people are kind of getting used to it and that that's the end of it. They are regrouping, redoubling, retripling their efforts. So that's why I say watch, just be careful and keep your finger on the pulse of what happens between now and the end of the year. Now, what I'm saying is not a yay or nay of any particular candidate or any particular party. The parties are as much, uh, 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 um, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, the parties are as much, a, a I don't want to use the word conspiracy, I don't want to overuse that word, but the parties yeah. are as much a, 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 a like, and look over here while we do what we're doing over here. That's what that is. Yeah. Look at the red and the blue yeah. over here while we're doing what we do over here. It's what they're doing yeah. over yeah. here that's the mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. You see? So over here, yeah. that's the window dressing. But over here, but through it all, I want to leave you by saying what Imam Muhammad said, and I've told you this before. He said, I know what they say about the New World Order. He said, but what I'm telling you is that Allah is going to bring in his New World Order using their hands. I'm going to leave it at that as I greet you in peace with the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. Salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. Wonderful class. Thank you for sticking with me. Instructor, are we staying in? Thank you. Yeah, we, we're going to uh, come back in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna, we, we'll sign back in. All right, folks. Thank you. No problem. Well, like my salam. You smell like cabbage and chicken and everything. Yeah. <laughs>